In this video, we're going to talk about the complex derivative and holomorphic functions. So let's recall a little bit of calculus one. So if you had a function whose inputs are real numbers and outputs are real numbers, let's talk about what's it mean for this function to be differentiable at a real number. So we're going to say that this function f is differentiable at a particular real number, x naught or x sub zero, whatever you like to say, uh, if the following limit exists. And when I say it exists, notice at the end, I mean it's got to be a real number. It can't be an infinity or a minus infinity, and of course it can't be, it does not exist. Anyway, let's look at what is that limit doing. We're going to take the limit as x approaches x naught, and we look at this quotient, f of x minus f of x naught. That's the difference in the outputs of the function divided by x minus x naught. Notice that's the difference of the inputs of the function. And of course, you probably recognize that. You call that thing a difference quotient. Perhaps you've seen another definition of the derivative that utilizes the variable h, or the letter h. And uh, it's the same thing above, though, as the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x, all divided by h. And so again, to say a function's differentiable at this point x naught, uh, or in my case in that bottom one, I should have x zeros in there instead of x's. Um, requiring though is that that limit is a real number. It's got to exist. And just let me give you some kind of visual intuition for what the derivative does. And so over here, if I try to visualize that difference quotient there, remember if I zoom in, if you allow me to zoom in, I've got my function in red there, f, and I'm picking x naught is the special point that I care about, and I'm saying let's pick a value x that's uh, kind of close to it. And so I plot those two points when I plug in x0 and I plug in x, and I draw the line that connects those two points. And we call that, remember, the secant line to the graph of the function through those two points. And the idea is, now if I scroll back over to the definition for a moment, I'm going to take the limit as x approaches x0 or x approaches x0. And so what you can imagine here is what if I took that blue point and dragged it a little bit closer uh, to the green point. And so I've got maybe another, uh, another frame of this, if you like. So just notice I took the blue point and I scooted it a little bit closer closer, and uh, I'm still going to measure the slope of that secant line. Remember, that's what that difference quotient does. It measures the slope of that secant line, right? Change in y over change in x. And then finally, like what should the limit be? Well, the limit should just be what happens when you actually get to the green point, x0, and that's on the bottom. And again, uh, in this picture down here, this is the last frame of my terrible animation. In the last frame, when you finally get to the green point, what you end up with is the tangent line to the point. So again, when you drag that blue point towards the green point, we're just tracking the slope of the secant line. And if the limit exists, that, shlo that slope should turn into the slope of the tangent line uh, at the particular point I'm interested in. And remember, that is what we typically think of as the derivative. The derivative is the value of that slope. It is that number. And I just wrote that again right here. You can think of this number f prime of x0 as the slope of the tangent line. So it's the slope of that orange line at that particular point. Now let's talk about, this should be about, complex numbers. I don't know where the B went, where the O, they're both gone. Anyway, so let's take G to be some domain in the complex plane. And remember what a domain is. So I am going to use like the kind of formal definition of a domain that you were introduced to in the uh, little topology video in this playlist. So remember a domain is an open connected set in the complex plane. Now let's take a function whose whose domain is g and whose outputs are complex numbers. And let's say z0 is a particular point that's interior to g. So it's just in g. All right, and so you could argue to me, aren't all points of an open set interior points? Yes, you're right, of course. So it's a little bit redundant. But I'm just trying to, to uh, make sure we all agree that okay, z0 is somewhere in g. So there is a good picture right there. And what we want to do is, OK, I've got a function. What, what's the derivative going to be? Let's just define it the exact same way. Let's just take. Uh, say that f is differentiable at this complex number z0 if the following limit exists. So I just take the limit as z approaches z0 of, again, the difference in the outputs is in the numerator, divided by the difference in the inputs is in the denominator. And again, I'm requiring to say it's differentiable at z0, it's got to be a complex number. So that's at the end what I mean by is an element of c. It's got to exist as a complex number. So in this case, we're going to denote this limit by f prime of z0. So we're just going to continue to use that calculus notation with a prime for a derivative. Of course, depending on you know, what you're reading, you might see like a d, dz kind of stuff like that. That's totally fine too. It's not just one way to denote this stuff. And again, we're going to call this the derivative of f at z0. Now, be careful here because uh, when we're looking at calculus, you know, the calculus one was nice because I could visualize things and I could, I could think about the derivative if I scroll back up as, oh, it's just the slope of that orange line. 
and so I can kind of visualize what's going on. Complex is a little bit harder though, because you know the graph of a complex function, it's four dimensional, right? The inputs are two dimensional, the outputs are two dimensional, so the graph is four dimensional. So it's not particularly helpful to try to think of the derivative of my function as the slope of some tangent line to a point, right? I can't really visualize what's going on anyway, um, at least not in that clear of a sense like thinking of a graph. So what can we kind of do if we wanted to track this a little bit? So if you uh, want a picture, so let's go ahead and just draw a picture. Okay, here's my domain G, and I'm taking two points inside of there, Z naught and Z. And I'm kind of drawing this as like vector notation here. So again, I'm just thinking of that complex number Z naught as the vector, you know, who's starts at the origin. I'm choosing to let all my vectors start from the origin. What are we gonna do? We're gonna take Z naught and Z, and we're gonna plug them both into F. And then, so the output should just be in some other copy of the complex plane. And maybe they look like this. Who the heck knows what F does? But I've got F of Z zero and F of Z there. And now, what are we going to do here? What we're going to measure, what we're going to track is, we're going to go ahead and track the difference between z and z naught. And so that would be this vector, right? You might remember from linear algebra, when you add or subtract vectors, you get to, you kind of fill in that triangle when you let them start from the origin there. And then what else am I going to do? I'm also interested in what's the difference between the outputs. And of course, that would be that vector over there in red uh, that connects the two outputs. And uh, what we're going to try to do then is we're going to try to answer the following question. When we're taking this derivative and we're taking this limit, what's it mean for it to exist? Here's how I think of it sometimes. Does f of z approach f of z naught, or in other words, does the difference approach the complex number zero, kind of at least as fast as z approaches z naught? Or in other words, does the numerator approach zero at least as fast as the denominator approaches zero? Right, because if the denominator goes to zero much faster, then you know essentially you're dividing by zero, and of course it won't exist there. So anyway, that's how I think of the derivative sometimes uh, to to try to intuit what's going on. We're still just talking about the right, like the rate of change. So it's the rate of change between the outputs and the inputs. Let's do a little example about what do we actually do? How do we get into the nitty gritty of maybe chunking a complex function as differentiable? And um, as you can imagine, you know there's sort of more complex functions uh, than we're used to seeing in like a college algebra kind of class. And so one sense function is, uh, what if I take the complex conjugate of a number? Is that thing differentiable anywhere? So that's a function that we don't have a good analog for in uh, you know, like a calculus one class. So let's check it out. So let's let Z naught be any complex number. Okay, so then F prime of Z naught, it's gonna be the following limit, and here's what we're gonna compute. So I just write that in the definition, but now let's think about what does F of Z do? Oh, it's just Z bar. And what does f of z not do? That's just z not bar. So that's the next line right here. And in the next line, let's think about what do I know about conjugates? You know, the difference of two conjugates, that's just uh, the conjugate of the difference. In other words, I can just put one big bar over the numerator. And then I notice that, all right, the numerator is the conjugate of the denominator. That's cool. And what else is going to simplify my life a little bit is, okay, as z approaches z naught, you know, the numerator goes to zero and the denominator goes to zero. So, of course, that's indeterminate. So, I need some kind of tricks in order to, to, uh, to mess with this. One such trick is I might just do a little swap change of variables here. Let's call z minus z naught. Let's think of that as w. And here's what I want you to track with me. As z goes to z naught, you know, that difference goes to zero. So, that means w goes to zero. So if I swap out W's for uh, all the Z minus Z naughts I see, this limit would be the exact same thing as if I let W just go to zero of W bar over W. And uh, why is this gonna be nice? Because uh, this is gonna be nice because now I have maybe some more ways to try to think about what this limit is doing. So let's think about, remember in complex, there's lots of directions that we could approach zero from. There's not just say two directions. But in this case, let's just think about what if W approach zero, or zero plus zero I technically, uh, along the real axis. So if W is coming along the real axis, I know what W looks like. W looks like X plus zero I. I know the imaginary part is zero. And so now let's think about applying that to you know, my quotient W bar over W. Well, if W is on the real axis, W bar is just itself. So W bar equals W. And so when I substitute that in, this limit then would just be one, right? Because W bar over W, those are the same. So that's just one. Now let's let w go to zero along the imaginary axis instead. And if I think about what's w look like if it's on the imaginary axis, if I scroll over a little bit, uh, of course the real part would be zero. So w looks like just iy if you like. And now let's think about, I care about the conjugate of that. Well the conjugate of that is just going to be minus iy, that's just minus w. So my point here is that the conjugate of w 
is negative w. And now let's substitute that in. And so the limit as I approach zero along the imaginary axis is gonna be negative one. And remember, I need the limits to match if I hope for the limit to exist at all. And so I just found two directions that give me two different limits. So of course that means that my limit as w approaches zero of w, not, w uh, conjugate over w does not exist. And so what that tells me then, that doesn't exist. Therefore, that's the same thing as f prime of z naught. So f prime of z naught is undefined. And so that tells me that um, the derivative does not exist at z naught. Okay, now z naught though is arbitrary, it was any complex number. So what we just showed is that the function that takes the conjugate of a complex number is nowhere differentiable. There are no complex numbers for which the derivative exists. Now let's talk a little bit more generally about the derivative. So the complex derivative is gonna enjoy all the same properties that the regular old calculus one derivative enjoyed. And so just to tell you a few of those, something like linearity, right? You can take the derivative of sums and differences and constant multiples easily. You got a product rule that's the same. You got a quotient rule that's the same, it satisfies the chain rule. So all that good stuff that you used in a calculus one class or a real analysis class when you're playing with the derivative, that all holds here too. Let's look at a little example very quickly. And again, here's like some other notation. This just says, take the derivative with respect to z of this polynomial, z to the fourth plus five z minus two. And if I did this right, you should just use like the power rule, right? So the first thing, so first of all, linearity, I can think about the derivative of each piece because I'm just adding and subtracting. And then also that's, uh, I could use the power rule for four z cubed. And then when I move on to the next term, again, linearity is kind of uh, also talking about constant multiples. So that should just be five times the derivative of z. Well, the derivative of z with respect to z is just one, so just plus five. And of course, uh, the derivative of a constant like negative two uh, should just be zero. And so by the way, too, a uh, constant in our case now would be any complex number. So like the derivative of i with respect to z would also be zero because it's constant. So let's ask some more of a function f. And what do I mean by that? And so just to give you an idea of where we're about to go, what we talked about in another video was about limits. And what we noticed is, okay, the limit itself does not necessarily have to be an output of the function. But in the case that it is, that's cool. And it's so cool it gets a name. In the case that the limit is just the output of my function uh, where I'm interested at, we say it's continuous. So like continuity is some kind of extra condition that's applied to limits. So like what we're about to do is, okay, the complex derivative is cool. Let's ask a little bit more. What if the function is so nice that you could draw some disk around your complex number z0? And so I've got a little picture for you on the side. I've drawn some disk around z0, and notice it's completely contained in g. Here's the thing I'm gonna ask. Here's what I mean by nice. Such that though, f is differentiable at all the points that are inside that disk. And so in other words, right, not only is it differentiable at z0, what if it's differentiable at every point inside of some disk centered at z0 as well? Right, that's asking more. That's asking for the function to be differentiable, not just at z0, but also sort of near z0. So that property is what we're gonna call being holomorphic. So kind of like continuity with some kind of extra condition on a limit, holomorphic is some kind of extra condition on being differentiable. And so let's just write down this definition a little bit more formally so that we've got it somewhere. We'll say that f is holomorphic at z0 if f is differentiable at all points inside of some disk, some disk centered at z0. Now, by the way, depending on what you're reading or, or, uh, or been watching, right, another word for holomorphic that you might encounter is analytic. And uh, in some books, they might introduce the two of them separately, and then it's a kind of a big result that they are equivalent to each other. So I'm just choosing to use the word holomorphic because uh, it's following the set of notes that I've been using here. But we'll talk about analytic a little bit later on. So let's do a little note about holomorphic functions. Oh, so sorry, up here. So this is where it's important that typically when we're discussing like the derivative or being holomorphic that we assume g, you know, the inputs of the function, that it's actually a domain because that ensures that uh, each point in g could be the center of some disk containing g. Remember, that's kind of the condition of being open. What's it mean to be open? You, for any point inside the domain, you should be able to find some disk centered at that point that stays in there, right? So that's perfect. You know, that kind of sets the table for us to even consider if it's holomorphic. So our domain's typically gonna actually be a domain in the topological sense. Let's do a little example here. Let's look at the function f of z that takes the conjugate of z and also squares it. And what I claim is that that is only differentiable at the origin, at zero plus zero i. And uh, you should check that. And so this would be a good exercise, you know, using the limit definition of the derivative. 
Now, let's think about, so my, my function is only differentiable at one number, zero plus zero i. Now, one number, you know, it's a set with one point in it. Well, that can't be a domain in the topological sense, right? A single point, it can't contain a disk, and so not a domain. And so what we just showed is that, well, if it's not a domain, then my function can't be holomorphic there. So since it's not holomorphic at that one point where it was differentiable, this function can't be holomorphic anywhere. And so what am I trying to, what's the big picture I'm trying to get across here? By definition of being holomorphic, holomorphic is just some extra requirement on a derivative. So being holomorphic at z implies that you're differentiable at z naught. On the other hand, so again, that's just the definition of holomorphic. On the other hand though, being differentiable at z naught does not necessarily guarantee you're gonna be holomorphic at z naught. And that's what that little example above shows. We're differentiable at zero plus zero i, but we're not holomorphic there. So again, holomorphic is some extra nice property. And so here's a question. Is there kind of an efficient way to check if a function f is holomorphic at a particular complex number z naught? And the answer to that question is yeah, at least for most functions that you'll encounter in an introductory complex analysis course. And stay tuned for another video about uh, what that tool is.